Uh, so Fab Labs came from, uh, started essentially its sort of genesis came from 1998. Um, that's when uh, Neil uh, Geschenfeld, he is a professor, he started a class at MIT called How to Make Almost Anything. Gesserfeld wanted to introduce sort of industrial sized machines that were normally inaccessible to uh, sort of the technical students at MIT. And what he found though was his class really attracted all sorts of uh, students, including um, artists, architects, and designers who were really interested. And that sort of insight and this sort of understanding of the sort of um, the larger application of what, what could happen with the space led to a larger collaboration that eventually started with the Fab Lab project, which launched in 2001. Um, Fab Lab began as an educational outreach program from MIT, um, but the idea has since uh, developed into an ambitious network of labs located around the world. So the idea behind a Fab Lab is that the space should provide a core set of tools uh, powered by open source software that would allow anyone, novice makers, um, with just a brief introduction to like engineering and design education to make almost anything. Now, at this point, no one, you don't have to belong to MIT, you don't have to be officially affiliated with MIT in order to create a, a fab lab. Um, there's actually, uh, anyone can create one as long as you try to maintain or uh, uphold the fab lab's four criteria. Um, and the most important one is that the fab lab has to be made at least regularly available to the public uh, for at least for free or at a very sort of minimal cost. And while it's not required, a fab lab is also uh, encouraged to communicate and collaborate with the other 350 fab labs that are still around the world. Uh, the idea is, um, and this is sort of the core idea behind sort of the internationalization of fab labs, the idea is that you should be able to walk into say the fab lab in Boston, uh, design something and create it. Create those, save those documents and those files, send them electronically to say the fab lab in Cape Town, South Africa. And then they should be able to make that exact same item because they're using the same equipment. So it's not generally, I don't think it's generally well known, but the very first library makerspace was actually a fab lab. Um, it was established in 2011 in uh, Fayetteville Free Library in uh, the state of New York. Um, and that's Laura Breton. Uh, she's pictured on screen and she was the driving force to help make that happen. One of my favorite things about makerspaces is that they're generally open to everyone. Uh, artists, scientists, educators, hobbyists, kids, adults, um, hackers, and entrepreneurs. And in fact, it's this sort of possibility of sort of cross-pollination of ideas and collaboration that's really one of the largest benefits that's touted by people who are trying to find new members in makerspaces. So what I think, like, it's one thing if makerspaces exist um, where friends and hobbyists and collaborators can come together and work with them from each other. Um, but I think it's quite another if the makerspace becomes sort of the definitive model of how to sort of address anxieties about science and technology and engineering <coughs> education. Um, and I say that having a science background and working towards trying to get um, you know, uh, people to follow if they're interested in those, in those, uh, into those fields. Um, and I really appreciate how the maker movement is trying to bring a playful approach to learning um, and through trial and error and building. Uh, but I think it is important to recognize that maker spaces tend to collect makers as necessarily always then to create them and to build them. Um, the community that participates in hackerspaces and makerspaces um, is pronouncedly skewed uh, white and male. Um, is that in 2012, Make Magazine reported that out of its like 300,000 membership list, 81% um, is male, the median age is 44, and the median household income is 106.